Hello, and welcome to Marketing to Complex Industries, presented by Godfrey, a B2B marketing agency for industries like yours. On each episode, we feature conversations about the latest challenges, strategies, and technologies for B2B marketers. I'm your host, Scott Troba. As VP of Creative at Godfrey, I help our teams unlock the amazing potential of the brands we serve. And on this episode, I'm pleased to welcome Heath Fry, Director of Marketing for one of those brands, Pixel Specialty Solutions. Pixel is one of the largest specialty paper companies in North America, and Heath's tenure with the company has given him a wealth of knowledge and insight into market trends. Heath and I are joined today by Godfrey's Director of Strategy, Allison Fetterman. So stay with us for a very enlightening conversation. Heath, Allison, thanks so much for sitting with us today. Uh, looking forward to having an interesting discussion about all things marketing and uh, and really about first impressions, making a good impression on our audience and uh, and also really helping to uh, you know, deepen those inroads and deepen those relationships with our existing audience as well. So Heath, uh, as, uh, as director of marketing with Pixel, uh, tell me a little bit about your experience and background. You've been in the paper industry for over two decades at this point, right? <laughs> yes, yeah. I have um, 22 years in yeah. September. Um, I've been in the pulp and paper industry doing marketing, uh, specifically with this particular company. Um, and prior to that, I was also in B2B marketing at another company um, local to the Harrisburg area, which was even much bigger, <clears throat> much bigger company, um, global, multi-billion dollar uh global corporation. So also B2B marketing there. And um, prior to that, uh, graduated from Penn State University, as well as a master's from James Madison University. Go Dukes. <laughs> Go Dukes. Uh, I'm my alma mater as well. Uh, what what was your master's in? To uh, prep business, for that? Uh, master's of Business Administration. Okay, yeah, so an MBA. Yeah. It did have an international um, bent to it. I've used that a little bit with some international travel. Right, because you, you have done, uh, I mean, I, I know that there have been a number of uh, European projects mm -hmm. uh, that we've worked with you on over, over the years. Yep, yeah. Uh, the company, um, prior to it evolving into Pixel, had um, close to a dozen operations uh, overseas throughout Europe. And um, we as we grew and expanded, um, we were acquiring more and more uh, facilities over uh, in Europe and UK, and and um, uh, it, it was specifically in Germany as well. So there was many different operations that uh, we acquired over the years. And you're right, um, you yourself and the Godfrey team facilitated many many of those acquisitions on the marketing side. Uh, but now we're Pixel Specialty Solutions, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. um, talk to me a little bit. That that name, uh, I think, can have a number of connotations to it. Tell mm -hmm. me a little bit about the company as sure. it is today. Absolutely, yeah. So um, the founding of the original company was was Gladfelter, and they, we and the facility that is our headquarters for Pixel has been continuously operating for over 150 years. So there's a, a long, um, rich history to the company. Um, recently, a couple of years ago, we were spun off from Gladfelter uh, to form our own company, which was is called Pixel, and we're owned by private, private equity. And since we've spun off, uh, we've continued to grow at tremendous pa pace. And uh, Godfrey has been there all along from the uh, Gladfelter transition into Pixel, establishing the name, the look, the branding, everything related to Pixel Specialty Solutions. And it was a unique opportunity to rebrand our company <clears throat> from what had been um, considered a, a little bit older. Yes, it was rich in history, but it also had a, a lot of, um, I don't know how you, uh, oldness to it, you know? Tradition. <laughs> tradition. There you go. Thank you. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> much better. Um, a lot of tradition to it, but the types of papers that we manufacture are very specialty, very niche. And so, uh, we wanted to break a little bit from that transition and brand ourselves as being, uh, much more innovative, which we are. And I can say now, two and a half, three years into it, the branding has really paid off. Yeah, it's one of the things that I've always liked about working in, in B2B is the, uh, 
kind of invisibility to a degree mm-hmm, of, mm-hmm. of some of that innovation and how uh, when it's most effective, it tends to just not be noticed in our everyday life, <laughs> but it does make it better. Yes. Uh, and the, the thing that, you know, even what I've used to explain it to my kids is, you know, the, the coding on playing cards and things like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, just the, the way that the tactile quality of all of these things that we come in contact with on a daily basis, mm-hmm. somebody has to invent that. Somebody has to, to pave the way for that. Yeah. So many people, when you say paper or pulp and paper industry, they think uh, the cut size copy paper that you get at uh, office or sta- staples or office max. Right. Um, and yet that's not the type of paper that we produce and the type that we do produce is the kind that makes your life a little bit better every single day, right? Whether it's um, the food packaging papers, that's one category. So food packaging uh, means a lot of different things. If you walk down a grocery aisle, um, you'll see Uncle Ben's rice, you know, and that outer layer, it, it, there, it's, a, it's a form of a laminate, but the printing uh, that catches your attention, that has to be printed on paper. Um, same with the Pringles can. That's all that uh, ink that's laid down onto that can is on the paper surface. Um, and again, it's a laminate substrate that's uh, spiraled into the canister form, but um, it just goes, uh, goes on and on. It can be soup cans, cans from Campbell's or Bush's Baked Beans, the labels that wrap around, or it can be the ice cream lidding, um, almost anything in the grocery store, you know, if it's got some flash to it. But even some examples where it's not so flashy, where the macaroni, um, craft macaroni, right? Uh, you have the pouch inside with mm-hmm. that wonderful orange flavoring. The pouch is just white, but that outer layer of it is still paper. So it, it's almost endless. And, and even lidding is another example. So if you have, you're enjoying your cup of coffee and you take the dairy creamer and you pull that lidding back, um, that too is, is a laminate with the paper on top. You know, paper has to perform in a lot of different ways that you really don't think about. And it's the technology behind that to make sure the grease doesn't, you know, get through to your hands or, or things like that too. So it's a lot of, a lot of technology and engineering that goes into all of that. That's a good point, because if you look at a fast food burger from McDonald's or Burger King, that clamshell, that's mm-hmm. paper, and you have that sitting on your lap, you don't want the, the grease to go through that. Well, same with the wax-coated papers at like a Subway. Um, that paper, too, is a type of paper that we produce uh, called sandwich wrap. And even when they wrap it and they fold it and then they put a little Subway sticker on it, that's a label. We do label papers. Um, So there's so many of these things that you interact with on a daily basis uh, with your hectic life that you don't even stop to think about it for one second. Well, and if we want to go a layer deeper to the to the true unsung hero of the label paper, there's the release paper, right? Correct. Yeah. Yep. I love that. Yeah. So for for most labels, uh, there is going to be a release liner. And so you can think of label papers, like I mentioned, or labels for wine bottles, labels for beer bottles, um, labels for a, a, a multitude of applications. Um, many of them are going to be on a, a release liner that you peel them from. Now, not all, not all release liners have a label associated with it. So think of like a Band-Aid. You pull that white tab off, that's a release liner. And uh, if you go into the hospital and they put IV in your arm, <clears throat> they'll put like a clear a clear material over it that sticks to your skin, much kind of like a, kind of like a Band-Aid would. Um, they peel the release liner off of that and then put that over the IV so you can see it and um, it, it sticks to your arm. Um, also like auto car graphics, you know, you see these buses and cars that are wrapped with these, these awesome graphics. Um, they have to be peeled off of a liner and then applied to the car. So yeah, liners are, uh, you're right. It's not something people even think about. Um, but yet they're, they're there in the daily life. Well, and that's, that's really a good segue into a question that I typically like to ask people, which is when you explain what you do for a living to people who are not in the industry. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, when I have to explain B2B advertising to people who just think, what, you do like ads in magazines? Do you do TV (laughs) spots, that sort of thing? It's like, well, no, our audiences are different. Uh, A lot of times our channels are different. Uh, what are what are the kinds of examples that you give when people say, what exactly is it that you do every day? Like, what do you do for a living? Yeah, the easiest answer I can give is that we help make life look better. 
Um, and then from there, they, they still look at you like, okay, so what do you do? Um, and it's those examples that we already talked about that when you explain how people interact with the product, um, then they, th that the light bulb goes off and they're like, Oh my gosh, I never even, I never even thought about that. Um, you know, if you have young children and you read a book to them at nighttime, well, that's printed on paper and that's printed on our paper. You know, we make book publishing paper and we have since going back, we talked about the rich history since the 1890s, we've been making book publishing paper, the envelopes that you get in the mail, um, the security documents that you, you know, uh, it could be diplomas or marriage licenses, or it could be, um, if you're buying a home, you know, think about all those papers you're signing. And some of them are actually multi-ply, multi-layered. So in those cases, they, they're going to be not just security papers, but carbonless papers. So we do that too. Um, and you can just sit here and ra ramble on and on and on of all the different things and different ways that people interact with paper. Uh, and as you do that, you, you under people start to get the picture. Okay, yeah, yeah, it, yeah that makes things a little bit better. You want to hit the point where the light goes off and, and you see it, <laughs> mm -hmm. but before they glaze over. Yeah, I've exactly. Had that a number of times too. <laughs> yeah, because because by that point I'm wound up. I'm getting excited, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Allison, how about you? I don't think I've ever asked you that question. Like, how? Do, what, what? What sorts of uh, ways do you use to explain to people what you do for a living? I need to work on my elevator speech with that because yeah. it's different every time, and I get a lot of. And sometimes I just give up too, depending on who my audience is, because I get the same questions. Like, yeah. do you do television commercials, or and I, how would I say is that it's not like selling chocolate to Joe on the street, right? Mm -hmm. It's not that direct sale to the consumer. It's a different, to your point, it's a different audience. It's a much longer buying process and it's different yeah. ways to reach them and it's different uh, selling points. But um, that's usually the example I give. Yeah. I mean, if we, if we talk about a product like M&Ms and, and how they used to say they melt in your mouth and not in your hand, like <laughs> we actually help the people that make the paper that make it so they don't melt on the shelf. Like, <laughs> that's right. You know, uh, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's the stuff you never think of, you right. know, really fascinating. Um, along with that, a good, a good sort of follow-up question is, uh, is from your you know, career to date, what are you most proud of in terms of all the things that you've worked on yeah. and the things that you've, uh, that you've sort of helped us spearhead? Um, well, I guess you could answer it a couple different ways. One thing would be that, you know, every, few years, I sort of reevaluate what it is that I'm doing and who I'm doing it with, you know, the company that I'm working with, working for. And I guess if you think about uh, the fact that I've worked for the same company for 22 years, I, that was never planned. I figured, you know, that the model is that you're, you're taught in business school, you know, three years, five years, and then you move on to an, another challenge. But, um, what I found in the B2B space is that, um, you know, these big multi-billion dollar companies, you might think that they have these massive marketing departments. They really don't. At least I've never found that to be the case for the most part. And as a result, you have the flexibility and freedom to do uh, what as much as you possibly can take on. You know, there's no company that's ever going to say, no, you're doing too much. So, so, so you take on as much as you feel comfortable with and you look, you have to look externally, um, to companies like Godfrey for that additional, um, horsepower because there's only so much you can handle yourself. And so I guess if I look back over the course of the 20 some years, just with this particular company, um, I guess maybe one of the things I'm most proud of is the ability that I've had to be engaged in all these different fronts that that comprise marketing from advertising and social media and market research and everything that is marketing and i've uh i'm just as excited today as i was 20 some years ago and it's thanks to you know partners like like godfrey that have helped make it exciting and um, helped me to hit these home runs with with the management team um, uh, so that we can continue, uh, w working and, and developing, uh, the type of marketing materials that, that the company needs to be successful. 
And based on my experience working on the account with you, you're the go-to person for <laughs> everybody across, you know, all of the different areas of the company. So you certainly have your hands in a lot of a lot of the different areas. I do. Uh, that's part of the challenge. Um, it's a curse and a blessing. You know, when we do good work together, um, it is recognized throughout the company and more people come and more people ask for help and, and it continues to grow and you do it um, quickly and then they want it faster and you do it again. They want it even faster and they want more. And so, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Positive problems. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and I've, I've been there. I mean, you, you gave me a plant tour uh, mm -hmm. some years ago and um, I saw the way that, that everybody recognized you from, you know, sort of the folks in the, in the main office, like all the way out to the people out on the lines doing the work. Uh, you know, kind of from the white collar area of it all the way to the blue collar area. Everybody knew who you were. Um, everybody sort of had a, a good rapport with you. Uh, and I, I thought that was really interesting in terms of the way that they understand your role mm -hmm. at the company. Uh, it's very, very interesting. And I think that there is... There, there's an energy and an excitement that, that you have. It's something that, that Godfrey shares, you know, for the work that we do. Uh, and it, a lot of it is because we can see the impact that our work has on the world around us, mm -hmm. right? And at Godfrey, we talk about, um, you know, clients and industries that make the world work better. How would you say, and I think you've touched on it a little bit, mm -hmm. but how would you say that, that, uh, that Pixel is making the world a better place? Sure. Um, you know, now more than ever, there's a lot of um, attention being giving, given to things like plastic materials. You know, we, we use paper, as I mentioned, and, and people consume plastic. Unfortunately, you know, on, on the paper side, uh, I should say fortunately on the paper side, it is a recyclable, reusable type material. You know, we, we do cut the trees um, and then they regrow. Uh, and the recycling rate of paper is about 70%, according to the American Forest and Paper Association, on, on an annual basis. So it's the most recycled um, raw material, you know, that we that we use. Um, on the plastic side, unfortunately, we're, we're, we're all seeing it. We see pictures of plastics, especially single-use plastics, plastic mm -hmm. water bottles and utensils and all that kind of stuff washing up on, on beaches and or, or just floating out there in the ocean, you know, due to the currents. And, and it just keeps growing and growing. Um, so one of the many things that we have um, available to us now is, is a technology that uh, where we apply coatings, special coatings to paper to create barriers. And it enhances the performance of the paper, especially on the packaging side. And uh, so that allows our customers, our converters, and then the, the big brand companies themselves to shift some of their production uh, and packaging materials from plastics to paper the papers are just going to be easier to recycle um, and even if they were to get outside the recycling stream it is something that can break down in the environment it's not going to be um, you know like a plastic that has you know hundreds of years or more yeah. uh, of uh, life well yeah and it's it's interesting to me um, I know from being in I, I came up uh, through doing graphic design mm -hmm. and had a lot of in-house design jobs um, up until, you know, moving into actually the advertising realm. But I remember 15, 16 years ago when I really started to see that FSC certified mm -hmm. and, uh, and remind me what that means. Uh, um, forestry stewardship council. Yes. FSC certified papers. Like I couldn't even remember the acronym because <laughs> it's been so yeah. long. I know the logo. Yeah. Right. I see that on stuff. You see it on lumber. Mm -hmm. Uh, you see it on a lot of printed materials. Um, but that really is about a responsible chain of custody mm -hmm. from the point that the trees are planted, harvested, processed, mm -hmm. the, the whole thing. Talk to me a little bit about that, because I think that a lot of people still don't know that much about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there there are um, a couple different um, certification bodies. So FSC is one that people see a lot of if you go into like a Home Depot or a Lowe's. SFI is another one. Um, and they both serve a similar purpose, which is to 
you know, um, certify that the, the paper uh, or the lumber, whatever it might be, uh, has been harvested in a sustainable manner. Um, and there's also another one that's a little bit more on the European side, which is PEFC, which mm. um, I don't speak French or you know, so <laughs> I don't have the, uh, the description of the acronym. Um, but yes, our, actually our facilities, especially those that are more focused on the um, printing and writing type grades where you print, you know, like a book or something like that or envelopes, things like that. Uh, our facility in uh, Pennsylvania and in, o in Ohio are both certified to all three standards. So if a customer comes to us and says, hey, you know, we have an end client, an end customer, uh, like a uh, book publisher, you know, up in New York City, and they require FSC or SFI certified paper. Um, that's not a problem. We we can provide that. I okay. oh, I was going to say I remember uh, the you know printers and and mm -hmm. some of those folks being some of the first to come out and say we offer this now, mm -hmm. and here's what you can say if you want to specify this. Mm -hmm. um, very very helpful. But uh, yeah, Allison, you know, from your perspective, um, I'd, I'd like I, to know more about that too. Yeah, I was just going to chime in that you know. Um, ESG and sustainability mm -hmm. um, is a, a big hot topic, you know, right now uh, for manufacturing across the board. If people make, you know, aggressive goals towards towards that, um, not only for their um, internal teams but also, you know, for customers as well, and to mm -hmm. be able to meet requirements and participate in RFQs and you know mm -hmm. go after business opportunities and you know we're continuing to um, you know evolve that that story for Pixel, but there is you know a solid. Um, you know, story around their forestry programs and other sustainability efforts as well. But I know, you know, companies across the board are, are really looking toward to advance that, um, you know, and address those those concerns. I, I would think I and I know from your role, um, there's, you know, a lot of education that has to happen. People tend to think paper bad, plastic bad. Uh, you know, and it, it, it's really a lot more nuanced than that, you mm -hmm. know, as, as you both really just touched on. Um, you know, talk to me a little bit more about the role of the strategist in terms of, mm -hmm. of assessing what customers really need to see at the B2B level um, and, and sort of how you support a client like Pixel with, uh, with your, your knowledge and capabilities there. It depends. It depends how far you are diving into the ESG topics, right? That, that can also include things like diversity and inclusion, you mm -hmm. know, and all sorts of other governance. But in terms of sustainability, it really has to stem from from Pixel or from the company mm -hmm. itself. So, what are their commitments? How are they going to get there? You know, how, and then turning that into how we want to communicate that externally and internally. So, it really needs to start with the commitments um, of the company, and then. Uh, we certainly can come in and help shape what that message looks like and how you communicate that externally, whether it's a formal report, you know, we've done some sustainability reports for a number of clients, um, you know, um, dedicated areas on web pages, you know, public relations, all sorts of um, different tactics and, and content um, formats. Yeah, and a lot of that demand really comes from the public, right? I mean, we have to listen to the discourse that's happening out there. Um, you know, people caring a lot about things. I've noticed more and more sustainability reports coming out. Yeah. Uh, you know, from a variety of, of different places. It feels like uh, feels like the sustainability report is kind of the new annual report. You know? Well, I mean, there's and there's rankings from you know yeah. certain third parties that companies have to you know they get a, a number value to their to their efforts around that and that value, kind of what I was saying before. You know, you are able to participate in business opportunities. You're able to do mm -hmm. a number of different things with that. So yeah. Yeah. it's. Um, it's important and critical, you know, for the health of your company, not, and also values based, you know, decision making mm -hmm. as well. Right. So, yeah, it's not just, I was going to say, it's not just checking a box. Their yeah. investors are looking at this yes. and they want to see it. it. So, consumers, yes, but now even investors, very important. That, that doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, people want to know that they're being uh, not only smart with their money when they invest in a company, but also responsible. Mm -hmm. right? Yes, and definitely. Those are, those are definitely two two different things. Mm -hmm. um, let's let's talk a little bit about, uh, you You spearheaded a successful product launch mm -hmm. recently, and I think that was your, your first big one uh, with Pixel, right? Uh, tell me a little bit about that. Sure. Um, well, one of the challenges we had, we, we launched a new 
um, type of paper, it, it falls in the category of what we would call opaque. And so that's going to be more on the printing and writing side. Um, so you might find it, um, you could find it in books or um, any number of different print applications. You could even find it as um, artist reprints, you know, so it's, it's, it's a opaque type of paper. So it's not on our uh, food packaging side of the business, let's say, or labels or something like that. Um, <clears throat> but we tried to launch it. We we had it all set and planned to launch last year, which we did. But that was also the year of COVID when everything shut down. So it was definitely very challenging to launch it. Um, but, you know, a lot of the challenges when you're launching a product like that are, are internal. I mean, there's so much work that goes on behind the scenes. And <clears throat> excuse me, you have to stay plugged in with the manufacturing side because you mentioned that, you know, I know people in manufacturing, they know me, that kind of, that's because you have to work together as a team the whole way from um, management uh, down to the people that are making the paper on the paper machines. Um, what is the performance of the paper going to be? Because that's going to have to be in the copy of, uh, of the, any advertising material. Um, when is it going to be ready? Um, what's their targeted dates, if we have any challenges or setbacks, uh, all this kind of stuff. And so you work together as a pretty big, broad team with lots of different um, uh, members uh, coming together on um, weekly and monthly calls. And eventually we got it to the point where the paper was running as we wanted it to. And then then the challenge was, well, how wide or how breadth, uh, how, how, how much breadth do we want of the product line? And then you got to get the paper and you got to get it off the machine and you got to get it to the printers because when we want swatch books and it just keeps growing and growing and swatch books in and of themselves are a real challenge because if you make one mistake anywhere along the lines, even if it's just on the press as it's, you know, you, you, you it takes months and months to get all this stuff pulled together. And then if there's one mistake on press, you got to go the whole way back to the, the very beginning. So um, we successfully launched this opaque brand of paper, and we also had to trademark it, come up with a name, um, and that every every piece of this is challenging because you know in today's world there's so many of these pharma companies just making up names. So they they have a lock on so many different names, and and every time you you come up with a good one, well somebody already has it trademarked. So. Uh, we, you, sometimes you have to settle for a name. We had a couple names we really wanted. We couldn't use them. And so the name that we uh, landed on was one that we could use, one that we could trademark. But in hindsight now, you know, um, it, it's kind of the investments you make and put into it. You know, because now everybody uses this name for, for the product. Um, it, it's called Omnilux and nobody thinks twice about it. But when we were trying to come up with the name, everybody is so irritated that we couldn't come up, we couldn't use one of these other ones. So, um, but yeah, Omnilux, uh, opaque paper, nobody thinks twice about it. It rolls off the tongue. Everybody likes it. You know, my, my son and I are both avid record collectors. And one of the things that I have to, to remind people is that, uh, the Beatles, mm -hmm. even that name. I mean, it has a connotation because of the the presence of that band in popular culture. It's a pun. Yeah. Nobody would pick a pun and say, you know what? One of the greatest bands of the 20th century, we're going to go with a pun for the name. They would never do that. Right. And it was just what they went with and they imbued it with meaning. And I think that yeah. a good product does that. Yes. It'll imbue any name within reason mm -hmm. uh, with with meaning all its own. And I, I, I like that you've achieved that. That's good. Yeah. That I've, the campaign was also the first opportunity to take the vibrancy and innovation of the Pixel brand and That's translate right. that mm -hmm. on, in a, on a product level, mm -hmm. um, you know, with visuals and copy and, and our external communication with that. And when we do competitive research and we stand up those ads against what is typically mm -hmm. on the market, even from a simple visual perspective, it yeah. certainly, you know, stands out and um, has a differential that's exciting. Yeah. Because yeah, we also had to do product packaging, which we don't always have to do. A lot of our products are sold in rolls. It's B2B and sold to a converter and so on. So, mm -hmm. But this one actually did uh, go further down the stream, um, a little bit closer to the end consumer, if you will. And so it did have to have um, product packaging design and every uh, because we had a sheets um, product, not just big rolls. Yeah. And 
Yeah, when that was printed up and stacked up on a skid and delivered to a customer and when a sales rep took a picture of it, it looked impressive. It was very impressive. <laughs> so very well done. <laughs> That's really, really good. Very, very cool. Um, what ideas, I mean, we, we're, we're coming out of, we're coming out of this, this lockdown time, mm. uh, you know, this past year and a half has been challenging for everybody. Um, it's been helpful in a way for going back to the explaining what B2B is, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's been helpful in a way for me to help to explain to people what we do because everybody understands the concept of a supply chain, uh, because they're waiting 13 weeks for a refrigerator because a single mm -hmm. microchip, you know, uh, three companies down the line mm -hmm. is, is holding up production of, yeah. of a variety of different things, for instance. Uh, so people understand it. Uh, but you know, we're, we're, we're coming out of this time. Um, and I think everybody has sort of changed rhythms a little bit. We're changing our expectations about the way business is done. Um, where we're, we found new ways to communicate and new ways to do business. What ideas are most exciting to you right now? Like what, what's, what's on the horizon? What kinds of things are you, are you, you know, looking there with that, that gleam in your eye of this is going to be good. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's a good question. Um, when, so communications is something that uh, we're really hammering right now. You know, like I said, we've been in business for so long, but you just never stop communicating. And uh, even with the current customer base that you have, there's turn, there's constant turnover there. There's new people being hired. Um, the previous people that you used to work with at the customer, you know, maybe they're retiring and, and, and the new uh, generation is coming on and they don't know anything about you. So you just, you never stop communicating. And today, uh, you know, there's so many more tools that are available to us um, like social media platforms. And there's always another one being launched. Um, but I, I don't know just yet how to, uh, use the technology, but uh, in terms of excitement, I think what I would like to explore is either augmented reality or virtual reality. Um, we tried it some time ago, but it, that whole technology was in its infancy when we first tried it. Now um, that it's uh, more a little bit more widely used and there's more tools available to us, um, I could see something like that helping to tell our story because people don't want to just sit there and read something. And some people don't even want to just watch a flat video. You know, they yeah. want to interact with it. So um, theoretically, if we have a new generation of buyers at our food packaging accounts, let's say, um, maybe we could do something augmented where uh, there is an example of a paper product uh, or a couple of different paper products, but it, they can interact with it in a way that they're seeing something uh, beyond just that. And they understand the process that goes behind it and the products that are uh, help to make that end product that, that, that they're about to consume. So uh, it's still sort of foggy in my mind, but yeah. I, I'm, it's slowly uh, materializing. Very interesting. I'm going to ask you the same question, mm -hmm. Allison. Uh, you know, from, from your role as a strategist, what are the things that you're seeing that excite you the most right now? So we've been digging into, um, a lot of things. Well, we were digging into targeting. So with cookies, you know, Google announcing that cookies were going away and now this isn't until 2023. So we can not have such urgency around it too, is, um, all of the different, you know, targeting and, and digging into the, the, uh, concerns around that and just to see how we would have to adapt our programs from, you know, programmatic and, and other areas um, to to address that. So that figuring that out, um, we were certainly I was certainly, you know, looking into how that would um, challenge us, but also yeah. uh, give opportunity in a good way as well. Um, and also in in the area of, of analytics, um, we're you know trying to evaluate how to um, continually, you know, present data visualizations and um, be able to deliver insights into everything from, you know, targeting to what's performing best and what's not. And this has been done, obviously, through marketing for a long time, but we're constantly trying to figure out the best way to, to do that for our clients. And, and um, as an agency, we're looking in, into that as well. So um, that's really where my head is at right now um, and helping to move that forward. You know, it's, it, it's interesting. I mean, uh, 
to think about the ways that Pixel is looking to do things responsibly, mm -hmm. uh, really in advertising and, and some of the things you're talking about as well with uh, with the way that we target people for ads and stuff like that. There's also a level of responsibility there as well, which is which is a lot of what that current discourse is, you know, when they're talking about third party cookies and that sort of thing, um, you know, respecting privacy while also connecting people with content that they actually are going to be that's actually going to benefit them. And that's at the, it's the, at the heart of what we do. So, not, you know, none of that is, um, you know, mind blowing, but yeah. as, as new things are introduced and, you know, new challenges are presented and new tools are available mm -hmm. is how do we continually refine our offer, target better, you know, provide better performance insights, you know, and optimizations and um, mm -hmm. figuring that out uh, kind of on an ongoing basis, really. Yeah, because, you know, we have a situation where if there are people that live close to our facilities and they have a question or a complaint, um, they don't always ask it on our uh, social media platform, you know, whether it's yeah. Facebook or LinkedIn or something like that, especially like a Facebook. So we might be aware of it, but you can't go to their personal page and say, hey, uh, you know, I saw what you said and here's the answer. You, you would, yeah. you would make them nervous and, and scare them, you know? So uh, it's a delicate balance to try and get them to navigate to our page um, or a platform where we can address any questions or issues anybody might have. Yeah. Cause uh, you are a big part of a small town. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and like, like you said, for over 150 years at this point. Yeah. Most paper towns grew up, have grown up around the mill. Yeah. Um, schools were built mm -hmm. by the mills and, and, and by the, the family who owned and, and run the mill, ran the mill. Um, uh, banks were built. I mean, every, the whole entire community was built up around paper mills. And so that's still the case. And um, it's important to communicate with those in the community, which is a different type of communication, obviously, than to communicate with uh, converters, customers, or end-use customers, things like that. Um, it, it's very important to continue that communication. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, what is, what's the best example? Uh, you know, we're speaking about world-changing work. What's the best example of world-changing work that you've seen external to what you're doing recently? Um, and I, I don't know if this is the best answer to that question, but what comes to mind when I think of uh, sort of world changing is the fact that we just went through COVID lockdown last year in 2020. The economy came to a screeching halt. I mean, if you look at all the data, you can see everything you know just fell off a cliff. But um, in the work that we did with Godfrey, we never stopped working. Um, in fact, we did as much as any other year, maybe even a little bit more because there, there's, you know, B2B, it, it just doesn't stop. There's, there's so much work to be done. And with the tools and technology that we have at our disposal now, like things like Microsoft Teams and um, all the other different uh, communication platforms, um, we were able to work virtually for almost a year and a half. And in fact, I think it was close to a year and a half until I was able to sit down with with team members and face to face and have a conversation, you know. Uh, and even in throughout that year and a half, we even had some people, new people, join the team, and I had never met them, and we worked together for the past year. <laughs> so, um, to me, that's kind of um, that's significant because if the economy had shut down ten years ago, fifteen or twenty years ago, it really would have shut down. Yeah. Um, this was more of a temporary pause because we could still keep working. We could work virtually from anywhere. And like I said, we got as much done as as any as any other year. And we were new as Pixel. We were only about a year new as a company. So there was so much work we had to do, so much branding and establishing ourselves and uh, communications. And we didn't have print literature. We, we didn't have. We didn't have our website up. Uh, we were too new, you know, uh, yeah. transitioning to yeah. this this uh, new company. So yeah, I would say that the ability to communicate and and continue to working uh, virtually was pretty groundbreaking. You know, it's really fascinating because um, within the first couple of weeks of of lockdown uh, is when we actually started this podcast. 
um, I was I was writing blog posts and thought, you know, we we should really consider doing that. And I, I've talked to the team and we worked it out together. But this is actually the first time that we've done it live, all ah. in the same room. Um, you know, it, it's it's always been distance uh, because. You know, again, we have the technology to do that and to to sound like we're together, to sound like we're in the same room. But um, I, I just realized you, you walked in and I'm like, oh, I forgot how tall Heath was. Like, <laughs> you know, it, <laughs> it, it's it's really been fascinating. Um, how about you, Allison? Well, I think to kind of go off of your point, it'll be interesting to see um, what will uh, what changes that happen during lockdown will continue and what will revert back. Right. Or if, mm-hmm. um, you know, we taught, we had uh, another podcast about hybrid events, right. And how, mm-hmm. how they were going from virtual, you know, and in-person and then hybrid events as well. Um, and how that will, what will that will look like, you know, moving forward, but in terms of the way that we work and the terms of the way that we market. So a lot of our clients are n- no longer doing any sort of print because it doesn't, didn't make sense. Right. And this, in this type of environment too. So, you know, what will come back, what will stay, I don't want to use the phrase new normal, but what will Mm -hmm. become, you know, (laughs) the, the standard toolbox here, you know, moving forward over the next six to 12 months too. Yeah. Cause we, you know, some of these things, uh, the technologies uh, were strong enough to support continuing to do a bit, continuing to do business. Um, Some of them, though or more or more on their infancy so like we did attend some virtual trade shows that really didn't work very well i mean it it functioned but i i can see that type of technology getting better in some events maybe strictly being virtual um but uh that really wasn't there just yet and i think people will continue to be a bit resistant on that side you because it's nice to see people um, uh, see their physical products and, and have conversations, you know, face to face. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see uh, how things evolve and what hybrid model there is going forward. I'm, I'm interested in seeing how that hybrid model works, especially for people who uh, want to go to visit a place, but maybe you're a little bit more selective about what they do in person versus what they stay in their hotel room, have a late breakfast with their laptop open, getting plenty done and mm-hmm. interacting with people and then going down to the trade show floor. Mm-hmm. Uh, because, you know, for something like paper, I mean, you're, you're mentioning stuff like swatch books. I've mm-hmm. been to enough uh, design trade shows where it's like, you know, it's all about the the tactile quality of it. Yeah. And uh, it takes a lot to put those together mm-hmm. because you want to, you want to, you want to see it, you want to feel it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if I'm going to spec a paper for something, I need to know, I need to feel how thick it is, not mm-hmm. just know it. Exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So I, I, I see there, there being a balance there, but uh, yeah, Allison, to your point, I'm, I'm very interested to see what happens with, uh, sort of where we where we end up with that. I don't think that it's going to be exactly the way it was before, but I also think that people are very excited to get back to some of what they remember. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right, and even in some of the other you know technologies like you know marketing automation and things like yeah. that, you know, really pushing the pedal down uh, on the use of that and and proving that proving out the use case uh, for them um, from our clients as well. So. A lot of a lot of really good uh, meaty stuff there that I feel like we could even have an additional episode about a couple of, of each of the things that, that you said. Um, but in addition to all that, if there was one piece of advice that you would have for somebody at a company who is in your is in your shoes, uh, either whether it's a large team, small team, or an army of one mm-hmm. who mm-hmm. Uh, continues to do good work and keeps getting blessed with more work to do <laughs> yeah, because right. of that. Um, you know, what advice would you have for people in those positions right now? Well, I think the advice that I would give somebody is that you have to be flexible. Uh, the companies are going to ask a lot of you. Um, that's just how it is in, B- in the B2B space. Um, I mentioned before, you you can't do it all by yourself. You do have to align yourself with uh, strong uh, organizations like Godfrey um, who have the horsepower to help you um, get the job done, get it done in a timely manner and and help you and provide the guidance that you need. Because um, as I've been doing this for 22 years and there's still so much I don't know 
and I do rely on on the Godfrey team to help me with the social media. And uh, even if I knew social media, then there's a new platform, and I don't know that platform. And, it, and if we want to do advertising, well, okay, I know the platform, but I don't understand the advertising model that's behind it. The algorithms are different from one to the next. There's no way you can know everything. So you really need to work with uh, an, an expert team um, just to keep up with the pace of things. And I've seen you have to man to your point have to manage your internal stakeholders mm -hmm. just as much as you know yeah. external as well, and having that balance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you got to know how to deal with the the internal <laughs> folks because they don't understand half of it, um, yeah. but they'll ask you for it. They, they just know what they want, and they'll and they'll ask you for it. And it could be anything. It can be the social media. It could be advertising. It might be market research. Mm -hmm. um, it could be developing um, messaging around things like ESG and sustainability. Uh, it comes from all angles. So again, that's why I've been doing this with the same company for 22 years, because it's always changing. It's always something exciting to do. I think, you know, because, because you work in paper uh, and because you work in paper in Pennsylvania mm -hmm. and because uh, the the TV show The Office has <laughs> continued to stay very popular. Like my yeah. kids are now into it. My kids yeah. and their friends uh, are are big fans of Dwight Schrute. <laughs> um, what would you tell everybody out there who wants to know how accurate that show is to what a paper company in Pennsylvania runs like? Yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, we love that show. My daughter watches it religiously. I think she's watched it from every episode from beginning to end more than once. And if she's falling asleep at night, the office is on. So, yeah. um, yeah. Uh, so that is actually a paper merchant. So that would be a good example of one of our customers. So we would produce the paper from the trees, uh, through the paper machine, uh, put the big rolls or, or cut it down to sheets and then send it to the paper merchant. Because if you think about it, um, trying to distribute and sell paper across the United States or across North America is a pretty vast um, geographic region. So we only have so many sales reps ourselves. We rely on our merchant partners to take it to the next level and, and distribute it to whoever. It could be a, a converter or a mom and pop shop um, that's going to do some printing and then fold it into something else, envelopes, or work with the big banks. It, there's a big channel there. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's, that's a merchant. And uh, I don't know how accurate it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping not very, but. <laughs> well, I, I think it, uh, I think that goes, uh, it sort of goes to show how, how deep that business to business connection yeah. can go. Cause mm -hmm. you're going to sell it to those merchants, uh, or they're going to be, they're going to be distributing it and then they'll send it, they'll, um, sell it to a business who then gives it to a consumer or sells it to a consumer one way or another. Yep. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, last question, uh, for both of you is, uh, if you could have one superpower, right. Mm -hmm. What would it be? Keith, I'm going to pick on you first. Okay. <laughs> okay. If I could have a superpower, um, I would say to fly, but it's, but it's weird because I don't really like heights. Um, but, but I know if I could, maybe I'd fly low, but I, you know, <laughs> I think being able to fly would be my superpower. Yeah. Nice. I don't know if anyone ever saw this show. I think it was an 80 show called out of time where there's this, girl Evie who could go like this and she could stop time and then when she went like this time would start again yeah so I've always wanted that so like in moments <laughs> like when I don't know the answer to something I could be like boop and then stop time and collect yeah. myself and then it would start again I oh, would yeah. that actually would be the one I would choose but in my case I would abuse it <laughs> and so I'm 45 People would be like, you look like you're 80. And I'd be like, well, I sort of am uh, because I've stopped time so much. I continue to age while the world. <laughs> yeah, I just took days to finish that project while everybody was just like frozen. Still, right. Uh, yeah. So I, I, uh, I agree with you on that one. I would I would uh, I would have to use that with a lot of responsibility. <laughs> uh, fantastic. Well, 
Um, thank you both so much for your time today for sitting down with us. Heath, it was a, a pleasure as always to, pleasure. to sit and talk to you about, about your specific industry and Allison, uh, one of the most helpful repeat guests that we've had because Thanks, Scott. what you do goes across every single topic we have. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Marketing to complex industries is presented by Godfrey a B2B marketing agency for industries like yours. Godfrey is built for technical products, discerning buyers, and intricate buying cycles. For more information, visit godfrey.com. And for more information on Pixel Specialty Solutions, you can visit them at pixel.com.